Good morning. Um, thank you, Mark, for the exceptional music every time I'm here. I first want to thank the Reverend Dr. Colin Bossen for inviting me back to Houston to preach, and I led uh, a couple of workshops yesterday. Uh, it's been a pleasure and a joy. Leading with love and liberation, what does it mean to lead with love while centering liberation? Dr. Cornell West, scholar and public intellectual, often says that justice is what love looks like in public. Hmm. So if we can work toward and create a more just and equitable world, we will be demonstrating how love manifests itself for all. Now, when I'm talking about love in this context today, I do not mean the flowery words of greeting cards or shallow platitudes of niceness. When I invoke love in this case, I'm talking about what Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King refers to as agape. To quote Dr. King, quote, agape means understanding, redeeming goodwill for all people. It is an overflowing love which is purely spontaneous, unmotivated, groundless, and creative. It is not set in motion by any quality or function of its object. Agape is disinterested love. It is a love in which the individual seeks not their own good, but the good of their neighbor. Agape does not begin by discriminating between worthy and unworthy people or any qualities people possess. It begins by loving others for their sakes. It is an entirely neighbor regarding concern for others, end quote. To be clear, Dr. King in this context was preaching nonviolence, influenced heavily by Mahatma Gandhi and Henry David Thoreau. He hoped to inspire African Americans and their allies in the fight for justice and freedom to hold fast to nonviolent protests as a way to dismantle the oppressive systems in place. I invoke the spirit of agape love here in the hopes of offering a framework for how we affirm each other in our speech and how we can center liberation through our language and ultimately our actions. So I want to share a story of my own learning process about how powerful turning to love when centering liberation can be. In 2016, General Assembly, the annual gathering of Unitarian and Universalists from across the globe, was held in Columbus, Ohio. I attended the Service of the Living Tradition. This service celebrates religious professionals that are entering ministry, whether they are ordained clergy, religious educators, or musicians. That year was especially memorable, not only because former president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, Reverend Dr. Bill Sinkford was preaching, but because of an awareness that was lifted up during his sermon. A few of the fellowshiped clergy sitting on the stage held up signs behind him that read in capital letters, ouch, O-U-C-H every time ableist language was referenced. When the word stand was said, the signs were lifted. If the word see or hear was said, the signs were lifted, ouch. The organizer of this awareness campaign was the Reverend Teresa Inez Soto. Now Reverend Soto now is one of my dearest friends, but at the time we had only met socially. And I found myself wondering why they would be so offended by metaphors. Sure, Reverend Soto has had accessibility issues since they were born, and I knew that they were a trained teacher and attorney. Surely metaphors was something that we would be allowed to have and use in a religious setting. At one point I found myself thinking, why are they trying to take away my metaphors? I wanted to defend the use of metaphors and explain that those to those holding the signs that we can't just give up on beautiful language. Thankfully, before I engaged in any of these discussions, I returned home from Ohio to Seattle and I started reading the ways that ableist language excludes so many. I started to ask myself, 
What is it that I am holding on to by arguing and fighting and continuing to want to say whatever I want? Consider, now I had to consider that what I want to say was perhaps painful and excluding of some. Now, and then I started thinking about phrases that I no longer say once I learned their origins. For example, I no longer use the expression rule of thumb because it harkens back to an old English law that allowed a woman to be beaten by her husband as long as the stick was no larger than his thumb, hence rule of thumb. Yep, <laughs> once I learned that history, it was easy to let go of that phrase. <laughs> so if I learned that my use of the word stand to mean affirm was harmful and exclusionary, why was I holding on? I realized that one of the ways I want to show up in the world as a person of faith is to listen and respond in ways that are loving, agape love. I found that love rooted in liberation in this case was to learn ways to minimize ableist language. The UU musician and songwriter Jason Shelton changed the title and lyric of the song Standing on the Side of Love to Answering the Call of Love. I actually like that even better, right? We are called to love. We are called to agape. We are moved to answer the call of love rooted in liberation for all. Another way we can answer the call of love rooted in liberation is by using the pronouns that a person asks you to. Don't argue about singular or plural. And for the record, Webster's Dictionary now recognizes the word they as singular. And someone just told me that the word of the year in 2019 was the word they, right? So we really do not have any reason not to show respect and love by listening and responding to what is asked of all of us. In the case of using a person's correct pronouns, studies have indicated that using a trans and non-binary person's correct pronoun and name lowers their rate of suicide and depression. You are engaging in love rooted in liberation when you listen and affirm rather than argue about correct grammar. Now, I'm going to take a guess. There's at least one person in this sanctuary thinking, oh, she's talking about politically correct speech. Now, first I want to name that even the notion of PC speech is nonsense and the term itself is absurd because there is nothing correct about our politics. To be clear, our politics are not the place to look for inspiration or ways to treat each other. Amen to that. Thank you. <laughs> what we are talking about is our humanity and the humanity of all those around us who are naming that they are in pain. We continue to work at the great human experiment that is the United States, a place where I would guess that every country on earth is represented, where we live together in a way that we attempt to form an identity that is both common and yet unique. In order to accomplish this Herculean task, we must be intentional and be willing to decenter our own narrative and our own point of view. I had to do that when I was, when every time I saw the signs held up that said, ouch, I had to ask myself, am I going to center myself or am I going to listen and respond and affirm? Unitarian Universalism can be a reflection of United States culture. And I say can be, we have the potential to be and we not currently are. Because while we do have ethnic and racial diversity within Unitarian Universalism, the majority of our brick and mortar spaces remain predominantly Eurocentric. Now, this isn't good or bad, it just is simply limiting. There are those that believe Unitarian Universalism is not broken and is fine just the way it is. Those voices have named feeling marginalized and silenced as a result of the events of the Spring of Our Enlightenment of 2017. 
Those folks, I would say, want to make Unitarian Universalism great again. They decry the limits put on our speech. After all, I've heard, free and, what about the free and responsible search for truth and meaning? Doesn't that mean we could say whatever we want? The answer is yes, you can say whatever you want. That has always been true. And what has also been true is that there are consequences to all kinds of speech. When engaging in speech claiming to defend the rights of the already powerful and the already dominant culture, the consequences are that oppressive systems are maintained and the voices of the marginalized are silenced. When our speech is unkind and hurtful, we cause harm. Now, when we engage in speech that centers love rooted in liberation, the consequences can be positive and affirming and liberating. Because unkind speech goes unchecked, unkind speech turns, it, turns into hate-filled policies and laws as the history of this country and current events today demonstrate. What we say and our language is important. The hateful speech and disturbing rhetoric that is rampant on social media and from the current occupant of the White House is having devastating effects on the lives of black and brown people. It is hate speech turned into action in the most dehumanizing ways. As Unitarian Universalists, we are called on to affirm the humanity of every person, not only the ones deemed worthy, who is worthy and who is worth less, and who gets to decide. In July, this past July 2019, there were demonstra demonstrations all over the nation protesting the inhumane and unconscionable concentration camps that are being maintained for profit on our southern borders. Thousands and thousands of people of all ages, including infants, toddlers, and youth, and adults of all ages are being held in detention centers for the supposed crime of not waiting in some imaginary line. The fact is, it is not a crime to seek asylum. However, the speeches and rhetoric that this administration chooses to name is an inaccurate one that deems human beings illegal. Words matter, and no human being is illegal. These centers are overcrowded, and the people in them are being treated worse than any animal would be allowed by law to be treated. I often wonder what is happening to us and what have we become. We Unitarian Universalists love our words and our intellectual discussions. So I want to just take a minute to talk about the word theology. The word theology means the study of the nature of God and religious belief. Now, for, for many Unitarian Universalists, this understanding and the study of the nature of God and our beliefs are rooted in how we relate to each other and the world around us. We are not a creed-based faith. We do not have a statement of belief, of, of belief in order to identify as a Unitarian Universalist. Rather, as a covenantal faith, we enter into agreements of how we will love, honor, and affirm each other and all living beings and our earth. In my frame of reference and how I understand and live out my faith, there is no separation between theology and social justice. I grew up in a strict Muslim home and one of the mandates that my mother passed on to me is that God will judge us by how we treat the poor. We will be judged by how we treat the least among us. My mother made no secret of her disdain of the Saudi Arabian and United Arab Emirate governments who, with their vast wealth, have not had a hand in solving the problems of the world hunger and hungry and poor. To me, there has never been a separation of theological grounding and social justice. The two go hand in hand. We are invited to turn to love speech rooted in liberation, agape love to affirm the humanity of anyone crossing thresholds or borders seeking a better life, safer life for themselves, for their families, or for their children's children. 
Working for social justice and equity is an integral part of our theological mandate, and it is part of turning love into action. It is integral to our understanding of the nature of all that is holy and what is larger than any single one of us is individually. We, we cannot know or understand our theology without knowing and understanding that we are mandated to use our privilege to fight for equity and justice. Your minister, the Reverend Dr. Colin Basson, over the summer chronicled his trip to Europe on his blog, which I highly recommend reading. And while there, the news of what is happening here in the United States clearly weighed heavily on him. He posted on his July 12th post, quote, in the midst of the global crisis, I think that for the, the, far, the challenge for someone like me is partly about holding on to my own humanity. In the end, privilege contains with it the possibility of shedding one's humanity. I believe that there is only one human family and that we are all ultimately part of the same earthly community. Privilege is based on separation, the ability to move away from the experiences that most people have. And well, in a world filled with refugees, economic exploitation, and many other kinds of discrimination and systemic violence, I feel quite privileged, which is to say separate and insulated here in the south of France." End quote. We do not have to endure the continued chipping away of our humanity. We have it in us to prioritize and affirm the humanity of those with target identities. We only have to listen when we are asked. We always have the choice to remain engaged and informed in ways that help us form coalitions and move in solidarity with those who are working very hard to dismantle systems of oppression, many putting their lives on the line. We always have the choice to center love rooted in liberation. I will leave you with these words that are, in, that are excerpted from a book called Endangered Species, Enduring Values, an anthology of San Francisco area writers and artists of color. This is by San Francisco artist Sandra Bass. She declares, quote, now is the time to unleash our collective imaginations to till the soil, nourish the seeds of change with our aspirations, and bolster fledgling shoots promising new possibilities with ageless wisdoms, compassion, and courage. Not because we're certain that our labors will bear a harvest, but because we know that it is only through daily acts of loving and serving with and for each other that we live into our boundless, sacred humanity. Constant gardeners we must be, ever preparing the earth for full and abundant life. Amen, ashe, and blessed be.